Good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting in 2018 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic equipment to uh, access committee papers should please ensure that they're switched to silent. Uh, the first item on the agenda is a declaration of interests. Uh, Alexander Stewart and Jamie Green were appointed to replace Jackson Carlaw and Rachel Hamilton respectively as members of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee uh, and I'd like to warmly welcome Alexander and Jamie to the committee and on behalf of the committee I would like to extend our thanks to Jackson and Rachel for all the work that they did uh, during their time on the committee. Uh, so before we move on, I would like to ask Alexander Stewart and Jamie Green to declare any interests relevant to the committee. Convener, I have no interests relevant to the committee and I very much look forward to being part of this committee. Thank you thank very you. much. Uh, thank you, Convener, and uh, I'd like to uh, also pay tribute to my colleagues uh, for their work in the committee and looking forward to being on this committee. Um, given the external relations element of the committee, I'd just like to declare an interest in my membership of cross-party groups on building bridges with Israel and cross-party group in Taiwan. Thank you very much, and you're both uh, very welcome to the committee. Our second item of business today is an evidence session on the committee's inquiry into Scotland's screen sector, focusing on research, statistics and value. This will be our last evidence session with stakeholders before hearing from Creative Scotland and the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs next Thursday. The committee then intends to publish its report before the summer recess. Uh, I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, uh, Dr. Michael Franklin uh, of the Institute for Creative and Cultural Entrepreneurship at Goldsmiths College, the University of London, uh, Andrew Barnes, Associate Director, Allsberg SPI, Alex Tosta, Research Manager, RSU team at the British Film Institute. And Inge Sorensen, Lecturer in Digital Economy and Culture um, at the University of Glasgow. I'd like to begin, if I may, um, by asking uh, Mr Barnes uh, some specific questions because I know that uh, your consultancy, Allsberg SBI, was involved in preparing some of the data on which uh, in which the screen unit, uh, the screen unit collaborative proposal uh, is based, is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, in terms of um, in terms of the underlying data about uh, the screen sector in Scotland, um, what what was your feeling in terms of what you had to work with in terms of preparing the the data for this report? I think uh, the overall impression is that there is a lot of data out there, but perhaps the coherence of that data in terms of having a, uh, a number of different data sets that um, align with one another and which can be used in a, in a single fashion was perhaps lacking. So um, as you'll note from the report we wrote, the, uh, we had to put a range of, of findings in for turnover GVA and uh, FTE employee numbers on the basis that we couldn't be sure from the data that we wouldn't double count. Um, that's, I mean, there are a variety of reasons for that. I don't know if you want me to go into those at this stage or whether you have a follow-up question. It, it's, it's quite a technical issue uh, for, for many of us. Um, but, you know, there are some things that leap out in terms of your comments in your report, and one of them is the risk of double counting, which you have addressed in some of your figures. Uh, do you think that, are you satisfied that the data doesn't contain any double counting? I think we can be satisfied that the lower end estimate doesn't contain any double counting, but the risk then is of undercounting, of course. So we can't, from the available data, at least not without a, a, a significant amount, amount of granular research, which was beyond the scope of the project, have identified precisely what production company did what in Scotland. So whereas uh, the use of the ONS level statistics on companies and you know which companies were in which SIC code, um, got us a certain amount of the way, uh, and companies' house filings on those. Um, and the production spend data from Creative Scotland got us a certain amount of the way in the other direction. What we can't, with any degree of precision, tell at this moment in time is where in the middle those overlap and the degree of overlap. Has anyone ever questioned the data? Not to my knowledge, no. Right, okay. Right. So, so what do you think in terms of the, the kind of... The concerns that you've pointed out about it, 
what implications does that have for the kind of very ambitious uh, targets that this green unit sets in terms of increasing production spend? I would argue that the major challenge that you face in, in as, as a nation in, in uh, increasing production spend is knowing is to be able to identify the degree to which you've increased production spend and to accurately measure the impact of that at a future stage. I mean, um, we work across many countries, starting at a much lower base level than Scotland, in implementing screen uh, support systems. And uh, we always tell these countries that putting data collection provisions in as part of that investment is something which is required to be able to accurately determine the impact of that investment. Um, so I think in Scotland, a certain degree of that exists, but there has to be the question of how one puts a data uh, collection methodology in place which allows you to um, evaluate the impact of the, the investments against their targets um, and then track that back to where you started. Um, the first part of that might not be possible, unfortunately, um, but the second part is absolutely critical as a, as a public In Scotland's credit. case, are you satisfied that we've got a robust process in place? Um, I, I haven't seen any data on what the process is for the screen sector leadership, uh, screen unit proposal as it stands, so I can't, I don't think okay. I can answer that. And before I move on, I just want to ask something specific about, about your data. You, men you mentioned that you include uh, non-domiciled um, cinemas, so I assume that's your, you know, your multi-screens. So that is going into the overall kind of figures in terms of uh, you know, the screen sector in Scotland in terms of employment and investment. I think probably m most people, and certainly for the pur purposes of our inquiry, we would, uh, wouldn't think that you know, your average multi-screen is really what we're talking about here in terms of uh, boosting Scotland's screen sector. Um, why was that put in? That was put in after discussion with our clients on this occasion. Uh, it was felt that without that particular piece of data, the overall report would provide uh, an underestimate of the impact of the, that part of the screen sector, and that reflects the fact that even if the screen, uh, the, the uh, beneficial owner of that particular cinema is not domiciled in Scotland, the wages which it pays to Scottish residents and employees would nonetheless have a downstream impact on the Scottish economy. Um, it's a tricky balance, that's why we disaggregated it in the way we did to make it very clear which bit was Scottish domiciled companies with a Scottish tax base and which bit was uh, Scottish employees only who would still uh, therefore receive some benefit from these. It's of Scotland that asked you to put that in, it wasn't necessarily your uh, inclination to include that initially. I can't remember which of our clients it was, whether it was Creative Scotland or Skills Development Scotland or Scottish Enterprise. Um, I'd have to look back through my right, notes to okay. tell. Right, thank you very much. I'll now uh, pass over to Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Um, it might be helpful if the panel could outline, I suppose, what areas of data are to be prioritised. Mr Barnes has talked mainly about the economic impact, but there has been submissions around audience participation and what the kind of softer value of the sector is. And also where uh, the panel identify where there are gaps in Scotland's knowledge, where we need to increase the, uh, the data. Um, so, from BFI perspective, I can show you how we would approach an issue like this. And for us, we'd be looking first for identifying what the outcome we would like to achieve from any kind of research or data collection. Um, and then from this, we'd be identifying what are the key and critical questions that need to be answered from this. And then we'd follow this up with trying to identify what data is already available and what data needs to be accessed. I think it's very dependent on those, where, what your priority is regarding data collection and any additional research that needs to be carried out. Um, I don't know if any of the rest... Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Do you think... I don't know if the panel had a chance to look in detail at the screen unit proposals. They have published a fairly lengthy document so far that's, that's quite technical, but do you think the, um, it's clear enough what, the, what they're trying to achieve, what the outcomes are? As you say, that would then lead back to what do we need to collect in order to reach this stage. Do you think, do you agree with what they've identified and do you think they have the right priorities in place? 
I think because I look at data from UK level, I know that one of the limitations with any data is there's not the granularity to go down to a four nation level. So I do appreciate that that is, I, I acknowledge that that is one of the priorities, I think, from what I saw in the documentation. Um, how you would get that data, I think, would need further investigation. Okay. Yeah, I just, I think those are really, really good points. I think the, um, the issue of interrelation of the data sets is, is really important. And as pointed out, in terms of this, the UK level, there's certain things that um, every um, funder of films across the UK would like to know. And there's also specific questions you want to have this granularity at the Scottish level. Um, but I think in setting up that work, it needs to be passed and parcel. I think it was mentioned uh, earlier, as uh, in when you're setting up any of the systems, it needs to be part and parcel of just the general work of business. So as distinct from, although there should be people with expertise within uh, statistics and, and understanding and delivering research on it, but as part and parcel of what happens, the, den the data is just part and parcel of you know, allocating funding or um, the operation of the exhibition sector. So all of that is feed through as part and parcel of what's going on, as opposed to having to think every three, four years, are we doing it right? It should be a continuous, ongoing thing. And that should be linked to what goes on at the, the BFI, uh, but also at the, at the European level as well. So, I mean, I just wrote the full round, it should be the, the role of teamwork, especially making sure that data can be mapped across different areas, is, is really important. In, in your submission, Dr. Frank, you also mentioned Edinburgh University and the work that they were doing. Do you think there's close enough collaborations in place or is there something that needs to be more developed? I think it should absolutely be more developed within both sectors. Obviously, I say that as I came in, but also there are you know, there's three current, uh, I think, uh, areas that are, are really important happening right now, as you'll have seen from the um, uh, creative industry sector uh, review from uh, Westminster. There's these proposals for um, linking that to uh, current bids for AHRC funding, where there is one uh, really interesting proposal that's through to the last round at Glasgow, which is to do with, uh, I think Dr. Sorensen can talk about in a second. Um, also one at uh, Edinburgh, which is to do with data-oriented creative industries analysis. And although film is not particularly mentioned within that bid, it is absolutely um, something that could be a great link up. I mean, there is expertise here that should be used. And there is a great um, a confluence of, an, of influence, of interests that could be maximized here, um, especially within the work that Professor Speed is doing on blockchain and things like that. So I think that it, it, it would be a win-win for everybody. I think um, also it's important to define what the screen sector is, uh, and, and I think the interim report, uh, it, was, it was interesting to hear that you're the first ones who mentioned um, and Netflix, and, and or not the first ones, but that the collaborative report is quite uh, media-centric and focused on film and TV, and the screen sector, of course, is many things. It's also games, it's also VR, uh, VR it's also... Um, mobile and uh, web content, and I think it's important going forward to also measure uh, these things in a Scottish context. I, I appreciate why um, the, the proposal needs to maybe be film and TV centric just now, but uh, f f to, to future proof uh, both the, the new screen unit but also uh, the development of the Scottish industry, I think it's important to take a very holistic. Um, view of what screen is. Okay, thank you. I mean, to add to what my colleagues on the panel say, um, I think that sort of coherence and, and uh, across the four nations is particularly important. We, as a company, are currently in the process of finalising a revised economic impact study of the UK screen sector tax reliefs. Uh, and part of the aim at the offset outset of that particular process was to... Um, try to the greatest extent possible to identify on a national and regional basis what the breakdown of UK-wide production spend and impact was, um, the data didn't allow for that. And even though people like uh, Northern Ireland Screen, Creative Scotland um, and the Welsh agencies collect data, 
they all do it in a slightly different way, and that leads to a lack of coherence. Um, so to be able to identify not just the impact within Scotland as a nation, but how Scotland compares to other nations within the UK, which are identified in the screen sector proposal, um, I would argue that it's important to ensure that there is some degree of, of uh, coherence across UK-wide data gathering, which allows for such comparisons to be drawn. Mary Gujan. Thank you very much. I really just had a couple of questions around uh, skills and uh, skills development Scotland and the research programme that they are that they are carrying out uh, with Creative Scotland. Uh, obviously, they funded and commissioned a research programme to look at exactly uh, what's going on within the company base of the screen sector, and they've said much more significant significantly what is going on within Scotland's freelance workforce. So it was really just to get your views on that and what you hope to see come of that. We also heard evidence as well that we think from others that they think that that should be an annual survey that's carried out. So it was really just to get your thoughts and opinions on that, please. Um, well, I think, uh, I mean, there's, there's interesting things going on in the, in the freelance workforce sort of survey space at the moment. Creative skill set have recently started to redo research, um, which obviously in our report, we suggest they hadn't done some for a while, which was correct at the time. Um, again, that, that might have some value and, and to avoid uh, double use of, of resources, it would be helpful to ensure that any work that's done aligns with what creative skill set are doing at a, at a UK wide level. Um, historically, they have done uh, broken down into nations and regions. Um, I would, I think, you know, when you look at the data for freelance, it's it's always a particularly difficult area um, because although there are a lot of Scottish freelancers working in the UK's film production sector and TV production sector, um, the question of where they ordinarily work is is a is a pretty key one um, and. It goes back to the question of definition and what you're trying to achieve as a policy objective here. Um, is it having Scottish workers? Is it having workers based in Scotland? Is it having workers who ordinarily work in Scotland? Because those are three potentially very different things. So I think um, you know the question of how you achieve granularity within the data, which would allow you to to sort of identify the Scottish freelance workforce, however you choose to define that, is is a pretty key one. Um, and to be honest, I've never seen anyone answer that question. Um, I don't know that there's a straightforward answer to it. So I think that's one thing from the evidence that seemed where there was quite a lot of data missing was in terms of finding out about freelance freelance workers. Um, and I think that we'd read that in some of the evidence we'd received where uh, I suppose it's been seen as, you know, it's not really, they don't see it as up to them to, you know, take part in uh, some of the other reviews that have been done. Um, but do you think that the review will be able to identify gaps in the skills requirement of companies in the sector? It should be able to, to some degree, at least at a high level. I mean, if, if you're looking at, you know, which departments in a, in a production sector have gaps, the, you know, the, speaking to the line producers, speaking to the producers, they'll be able to identify where they have difficulty hiring. To get to break down to the exact grade, so, ex you know, exactly what, level of seniority you're looking for that might prove to be a bit more difficult because it's a very fluid industry where people move around a lot for work um, and you know what's true one day might not entirely be true the next is if a different production comes up and takes somebody from Scotland to anywhere in the world fundamentally um, so uh, it's yeah as I say it's a tricky challenge um, I noticed that in the in one of the proposals it would there was something about using um, using, um, what are they called, um, the, uh, the sort of workforce uh, databases. Um, that's always a challenge because the most senior members of crew don't like to go on those because they see it as, an ex as a sign that they can't get work any other way. It's such a word of mouth industry um, that they will probably reject that approach. So there's always, it sh you should be able to find a way at a high level to identify where the gaps are, but in terms of the really, really granular stuff, I suspect it's only when you start working and start putting courses together that that will become more apparent. So do you think this is something that should be done on an annual basis to be able to... That would probably be helpful. That idea. Yeah, that yeah. would probably be helpful, but I think it would also... There's also going to have to be a certain degree of uh, qualitative data gathering as part of that rather than purely quantitative. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ross Greer. Thanks, convener. Um, just before moving on to a specific question around production spend, one of the frustrations that I think we've come across uh, on a number of occasions from the industry, the industries in this process is uh, a sense that uh, wheels are being reinvented that don't have to be. So before getting to a specific question, I wonder if anyone could just cite examples of uh, public bodies elsewhere, screen unit equivalents, that are effectively marshalling or coordinating the data collection required to actually grow and, and sustain industries. So I, am, I work within the research and stats unit, as you well know. And as part of that, we have an extensive database that helps us provide um, essentially a compendium of all statistics across a range of areas in film, which is within our statistical yearbook. So within this, we have statistics not just on the value chain of box office through distribution, etc., but we also do have some uh, statistics on audiences, education, as well as film economy. Uh, so that looks at the GVA of film uh, within the UK. Um, and also levels of employment. And we also look at public investment, so that just looks beyond the tax relief, but also looks to see who are the other public funders of film within the UK. I think the issue for the panel today is I provide data at a UK level, and it's very obvious that you want data at a Scottish level. And a lot of the time, it's not easily available. So uh, as you're about to go into production, I'll mention that. So within production, we track all... Uh, productions that are made, so film productions that are made within the UK, but it's very difficult to get data to identify whereabouts that spending in the UK is, is uh, being done. So the nearest we get to that is we get some data on location of shoots. So for example, we'll know a production is shot in Scotland, but we don't know how long and we don't know how much money has been spent in Scotland. So that's just one of the issues. But going back to what I originally said, so already at a UK level, there's a UK level, there's quite a comprehensive range of data that is freely available. But unfortunately, I know you want it at a granular level, and we're limited by the data that's available, but we're also limited by, if you go on the ground to a production, going back to the production spend, uh, the budgets don't work out that way if they say they want to do a month's shooting in Scotland, they will just have a budget for shoot, not where about that shoot is taking place. Presumably then that's not a unique problem to the UK that we would find that colleagues in, in the US, for example, where productions are shot across multiple states, have similar issues in trying to break down their data as well. I don't know much detail about what goes on in, in other countries regarding production. I only know in a general way, but yes, it is pretty much that. So I know when you get a large studio coming to the UK to shoot here, they will have, they'll be able to say, this is our UK budget, but, and this is what our spend is elsewhere, but they won't be able to go into, oh, we've done some shooting in Scotland, say, and this is how much we've shot in Scotland, and this is the cost that, of that. I mean, to speak to your question about the United States, um, because of the, the, the different way that uh, film incentives work in the US, um, and we've recently, actually maybe a year ago, finished some work in the state of Georgia on this, um, there tend to be good data on production spend on a state-by-state -state basis because it's the states themselves that incentivize the production and same in Australia, same in uh, Canada where the provinces um, provide incentives. You know, as a result, they get audited spend data which provides them with good detail. And um, you know, in some provinces, British Columbia, for example, they will even be able to break that down by which part of the, of the province because there are... Uh, additional parts of incentive uh, which provide an uplift for particular uh, economically deprived areas of work. That's, that's a relatively common thing in those sort of state level jurisdictions within federal, uh, federal countries. Um, in terms of the, you know, which countries do this well, I think there are a lot of countries that do a lot of work on this. Um, you know, we've worked in recently in, in Australia, which has very good data. We've, reached, we've worked in you know, Canada, the United States, most European countries. They've all got good data to a degree. It depends on their particular aims, and um, that's, that's always the thing. It's, it's, they collect data based on what they're trying to prove. Um, they could always put more money into it, but that's, that's a kind of how long is a piece of string question. You could always put more money into data gathering and analysis. It's there's always the question of how much it adds value. Maybe, 
it all be helpful to, to look at uh, the Scandinavian countries um, because there seem to be two needs for, for statistics here. One to drive the industry and tell us what the Scottish screen sector is, is, is really like, but also one specifically in this context to drive policy. And uh, in the Scandinavian countries, they have film law every four years uh, that decides what the sector should be doing and, and gives direction and, and budgets to uh, the, the screen funders. And they, in that process, there's a collaboration between the government who sets down the law, uh, but also the screen agencies, stakeholders and the industry. And in that context, data becomes very relevant and very uh, obviously uh, interesting for deciding what the future next four years would be. So um, that could be an example. Sorry, just very briefly before Dr. Franklin comes in. It's a really interesting example. Is there an element of trust making that process easier, that because the production companies themselves have a level of trust in, in the public agencies and in the government, there's that collaborative approach, that there is a, there's more of a willingness to share data than there is perhaps in countries where the relationship between production companies and the state is, is more challenged? That's a really interesting way of looking at it. You can also look at it in completely different ways because everybody has a stake and knows that the film law comes up every four years. And because it is a, a consultation between stakeholders, the industries, the, the various industry bodies, um, I, can, I, I know most about the Danish context, um, and the policymakers, uh, people know that this is coming up and, and know how to inform the, the policy making process, it has, uh, yes, it generates trust, uh, it also generates distrust, I'm sure, but it's, it's also, it's a quality control because the industry then, or, or, or stakeholders can say, there are these issues that are facing the industry now that we need to discuss and that need to be integrated into the future policy for the next four years. So, so there's a, a degree of collaboration, but also a degree of quality control that complaints or issues can come up in that process. Uh, and also it, it, it can drive real uh, important structural things in the, is, in the industry. For example, uh, the Danish film law uh, has, has quite a big um, budget allocation and priority set down in the film law for creating uh, non-format um, content, so web content, VR, there, there's been a budget allocating a priority in that. In Sweden, they have 50-50 gender quotas that are enshrined in policy, uh, or they're not quotas, they're targets, but you know, you can make policy decisions uh, that matches both uh, government priorities, but also the industry and stakeholders' uh, priorities. And it just seems to be, uh, a, a quite proactive and, and good way of um, organising your, your screen policy. It also means that it takes, a, you know, the screen unit, maybe as it stands, I don't know, uh, but uh, so far uh, Creative Scotland has decided in a way what their own priorities uh, would be for the screen sector. Uh, and that I'm sure takes a lot of energy and, and time and, and, and uh, resources, whereas if that's kind of a given and it's the agency's role to best deliver this particular film law um, that seemed to uh, create maybe a better process and a more transparent process as well. That was a really useful example, thank you. So, are we finished? Oh, Sorry, just very good. I just think it's a really good point about the trust issue, just to come back on that and add to, I think, what Mr. Barnes is saying, a very, very interesting point about um, you can always spend more on how long a piece of string idea, right? In terms of that level of uncertainty about how data will be used and to what benefit, there is that element of risk about we don't know the ultimate benefits if we go down that, that route. And so I think that is when, when there has been historically a little bit of lack of wanting to participate or to collect data within Scotland. It's been about, oh, what will be the benefits? And there is that, that uh, ongoing uncertainty which requires sort of the work. And so I think what you see in uh, the variety across Europe, um, looking at the way in which European Audiovisual Observatory, they deal with data from all different um, areas and see a great variety in the amount of resources that are applied. So um, 
the wonderful output of the BFI and the, the applied thinking of the CNC in France, where they've got huge amounts of resources done to this. You can see these applications. But I think it's the taking the best practice from exactly as Dr. Swenson says and use, applying that within this idea that some of it's going to be uncertain, like some of it's going to be experimental. Thank you. I have a supplementary from Richard Lockhead. <coughs> well, the, the issue of trust clearly began to address the question I was going to ask, which is how is the data uh, made robust? Because clearly the reasons why we'd want data would be the likes of ensuring that companies fulfil their obligations for filming and spending in Scotland, or in response to getting public support, they have to show that they've spent money in Scotland. So how do you ensure it's robust, uh, especially for companies from outside of Scotland who are filming here? And the statistics and the data and the research itself is robust and valid and therefore is of good quality and can be trusted? Or do you mean more about the process of... The process where you collect it and who collects it and ensuring you're, it's checked? So, um, so I'll have to refer back to the BFI. So within BFI, because of, uh, we produce all of our statistics and research for the public and in industry good, and part of that is we produce official statistics. So... That's part of the whole statistics code of practice, so all stats have to be for the public good. And by following that code, you kind of develop a sense of quality, but also a sense of trust in the statistics from that. And that kind of feeds into a circle where um, companies are more willing to actually give you your data in general. What I've noticed in film is there's a very large appetite for more data. And whenever we've had some user engagement, they want more data and they're willing to share it. But I don't think there's a natural ingrained process within film for actually sharing data. The best example of how data is shared in, within my job is through the, the certification process, which is certification so um, a film can be officially British and claim tax relief. And part of that is they see a benefit for the production of the film but also this has been, uh, this process has been established for many years now and it's also been reviewed uh, officially. And I think uh, this has been backed up by a team that has gone out to the industry and actually provided guidance of how they can provide this data. Um, so for me, it's a mix of all of those um, items. Um, if I want to refer back to Scotland, I would say you could look at that, but I think, as Inga mentioned in the previous example, I think it'd be really useful to see what other countries have done as well. I think the Danish example is, is actually a very good example of ongoing user engagement, which I found at the BFI is vitally important for developing any kind of trust in any part of the data and statistics process. I mean, I think... To speak to the question of how you ensure that people are, have uh, obeyed their obligations, um, the standard way is, is to have those data audited. Um, auditors tend to be required for every incentive system and, every, and a lot of public funding where there are spend requirements of that kind. Um, you know, obviously, they have a, a particular duty under law um, in relation to, to how, you know, how they sign off data and, and that leveraging that duty tends to be the approach that is taken in most jurisdictions. Okay. Can I just follow on from that? Because you mentioned um, different states of America and provinces of Canada earlier. Um, have you had the opportunity to look at just how, how rigid they are about making sure that companies that say they're spending the money in Georgia or British Columbia or whatever it is are actually doing so? And how does that compare with how we test that kind of data here? I can't speak to how you test that data here. I've never looked at it in detail, so I'd, I'd sort of um, <laughs> refer you to Creative Scotland for that one because, I, uh, because we, didn't, we didn't look at that. In terms of how this gets done in other jurisdictions, they tend to be very robust about how this, this, gets, uh, this gets done. I mean, um, there have been cases where... Uh, there have been cases in the UK where audited spend statements have been proven to be incorrect and those people have ended up in jail because of that particular um, issue. Um, so, uh, and we know from, from conversations with producers in, uh, in Ontario, at least, that the, the volume of checking which is required has led to quite a lag in, in how long it takes them to get their, uh, their funding back from the, uh, from the Ontario provincial 
tax credit system. So it, it all speaks to, us, uh, to systems which are robust, um, which take a lot of care in how the money is returned to productions which have availed of their tax credit systems and other, in, and other selective funding systems and where producers tend to see it as a cost of doing business to, to put that audit requirement in place. You know, there's two things going on here. There's what we're talking about here, which is the incentives from, for film, mainly through Creative Scotland or the UK government. But there's also, as you're aware, a separate Zofcom reviews going on in terms of the regulations of out of London spend uh, that we're talking about. So that, that kind of issue around robustness would apply to both those, wouldn't it? It should do, yes. Yeah. Um, I, again, I can't speak to how Ofcom collect their data. I've, I've never looked into it in detail. Yeah. Thanks very much. Stuart McMillan. Good morning, panel. Um, just, just like to pick up on a couple of points um, from the questioning from uh, Mary Goujon. I think the, the point was raised about regarding a, kind of a yearly update uh, of data. Uh, but surely there should be a, uh, it should be kind of the real time uh, model uh, should be applicable as compared to just a yearly update. Can I ask what's meant by real time in this context? I've looked. Uh, in, the, in the questions we were sent in advance, it was referred back to previous sure. evidence to the committee, and working through that evidence, I couldn't find the term raised. So I just want to wonder what the, the uh, what is meant by that mm. and that particular term, and what the the use of that is proposed mm. as. Uh, it's, uh, I, was, I was thinking uh, in terms of uh, kind of other sectors, uh, and prior to me becoming a, a parliamentarian, I, I worked in a, an electronics company. And uh, the data that was collected uh, was done on a daily basis. Now, I'm not suggesting that because I think that would be extremely difficult for the, for the wider sector. Uh, but to have something, whether it's um, weekly or monthly uh, updates as compared to annually, I think would be uh, useful and certainly would probably be helpful in terms of the, the data collection uh, for further analysis. I mean, I think the question that I would raise about that is is what you know what the data is, is are used for because um, one of the the things we've often found working around the world is that production companies and I'll, I'll speak about production companies in this in this instance have an anticipation that if they have real-time data about what's being produced what the market is doing what the you know how what consumers are interested in they'll be able to make films which or television programs which hit those particular demands. The challenge in this sector is that the lead time on production is so great that when you go from idea to final content, that's three years, whether that's for a piece of film content, a television program, or even a physical facility such as a studio takes a while to build, that the data that you've got at the start are no longer relevant to the market which, into which the piece of content is released. Um, so the question that I would raise in relation to real-time data is, you know, in terms of how it's going to be used, and it goes back to that how long is a piece of string question. It's, is there value in asking people to do this, or is it, uh, you know, based on the particular needs of the market and the people who are administering this, this product? Um, it's, it's not something we've ever identified as a, as a major concern, if we're honest. Right. And that's helpful. I, just, I wanted to test that, uh, that particular area, um, just because of, a, uh, of other experience I've had outside of, of here. The second uh, point, just in regarding the, <coughs> um, the point that uh, Mr. Toster spoke about a few moments ago, regarding the industry uh, wanting uh, more data, um, do you think that the, uh, the request uh, and the specifications for uh, for data that's been uh, that's been looked at uh, are clear enough, and uh, and how flexible uh, do you think that that uh, actually is as well in terms of the the changing nature of the sector and the change therefore the changing nature of data that would be required uh, going forward. Um, looking at, at the documentation that I was sent. Uh, to me, this sounded, to be quite honest, quite the standard routine data that film that the film industry is asking for. For me, I would 
I would naturally have to go back constantly and do this user engagement talk to the industry to ensure the data adapts to the changes in the industry. And you know, a prime example for that is 10 years ago, I, you know, we, were, we were only looking mainly at the value chain and public investment at the, in my team. And now that's extended to going further into audiences and education. And that's just through this uh, constant user engagement. Um, I do think there's also a need to, as we mentioned, definitions, flexibility to me is all about the parameters of the statistics and the data. And that is all about definitions, uh, touching on timeliness with this real-time data, um, as well as accu accuracy, as we've mentioned before. Um, so the data that you're collecting and what you want to collect data on, you have to be responsive to whatever the industry wants, but you have to bear in mind that you can't make these changes immediately within statistics. It doesn't happen this quickly. And also, I think, in a way, film does appreciate that when they're asking one question at development stage in a production, and that question will change by the time they want to release their film. And in a way, you've constantly got to be flexible, but you, on top of that, part of your quality is consistency as well. Sorry, I may sound like I'm going, I'm going around the houses, but in, in my head, I'm thinking very much in a stats delivery process. And part of that is, I know you've, you've wanted data on employment, as well as skills, as well as production spend. You can provide these consistently, but with your user engagement, you can actually adapt these to make sure they're more suitable to your film industry, say, in year five, because there's been changes between year one and year five. It's, I hope that's clear, clear enough. Well, that's helpful, but, but certainly it takes me on to uh, one of the points from uh, Dr. Sorensen uh, earlier, uh, when you spoke about the, the Scandinavian model and, the, and that four-year uh, cycle. Uh, so in terms of that flexibility, and, and also in terms of that, uh, that appears to be a joint approach, is that the kind of thing that would actually be useful to be implemented here? Um, bearing in mind the, the discussion with uh, Mr. Toster a few months ago. I, I think also going back to some of the questions that came from Mary Grouchon uh, earlier about skills and the, the freelance spaces, that uh, there is, just to take it back, um, there is a need for a more granular and better understanding of how freelancers work in Scotland, uh, how much they earn, what industries they work across, because often it's a, a screenwriter would write a corporate one week feature film the next, not quite like that, but you know, engaged in a variety of genres um, and a variety of different functions throughout the year. Um, also, in, in Scotland, there is a, sometimes a, a skilled drain towards London, towards other industries. Um, not just in Scotland, that happens so, a, across the sector. But to try and find out how do freelancers who engage in this sector actually work? How do they make their money? What can we do to keep them creative, keep them uh, in a screen sector and, and, and drive future developments in Scotland. So that's kind of one thing. And that, I think, could feed into trying to, A, identify what are the future trends, you know, is there throughout the years, do people start working more for uh, Netflix or developing content for them that they do for the BBC or whatever? Um, so where is the industry moving and, and what are people actually doing? Um, and also identify the, the, the skills needs, but also identify how can they continue uh, being creative in Scotland? Um, what what does, it, does it take? Is it, I don't know, tax incentives, or, you know, whatever. Um, and that could maybe feed into bigger statistics. It, it wouldn't be what you were doing, what were you? Is, is that, does that answer your question? I'm not sure. I, so I think I weird off, off course there. Yeah. It certainly it sounds like that uh, it sounds like needing to move to a, a big data approach uh, without uh, potentially having that clarity in terms of what the data should be what's actually going to be required uh, and also potentially some questions in terms of uh, do we have the uh, enough technology there to actually gather that information and collate it as well as the skills to do so and also the the capabilities uh, within the unit to, to actually deal with that has to be delivered, as, as you said, Alex, retrospectively, that you have to maybe engage in a census that would then feed into a bigger data set, or how would that? Um, <clears throat> so uh, what you've just, just described is the parameters of, of a data system. Um, 
how you actually have a starting point, which I think is what you're mentioning, is for me it goes back to your primary purpose and outcomes and and the questions you fundamentally want to answer. And I know I may sound like I'm I'm repeating myself on this, but from from a research and data stats perspective, those are fundamental. How you get, and I think once you have those clearly defined, then you can decide on an approach and methodology of how you get your data. And simultaneously, you need to have this user engagement running in parallel so that the film industry is involved in shaping its own industry, but also having a say in what stats can be used to describe the industry appropriately. And whether this is, whether to start this off, you decide we will run an annual uh, census, or you will first take an audit of available data on Scotland. Um, it's up for further discussion. I think that's probably better outside of, of this committee, to be honest. I mean, if you want to, tr I, mean, I, I know there are certain issues that certain methodologies won't help, and as Inga's mentioned, freelancers. Um, from the work that Creative Skills have done, freelancers are very difficult to even get into data because of the the whole definition around freelancers and the behavior and activity of that type of employee, employer. And that's just one example. Um, so for me, it's, I think it's all about setting out parameters first, and those are based on your outcome and the questions you want answered. Um, and I think once you've got those sorted, you can then discuss methodologies, real-time data, um, where do we look for the future of the data. I think just one more point is, I think, uh, when you talk about research and statistics, by the nature of them, they are retrospective, as Inga mentioned. That's because we have, we have to collect data at a certain time point and then report on it. There's no escape in that. And I know with the likes of Netflix, who say they can record what their viewers are watching or what their directors are making immediately, they have a very different setup to actually how most of the statistics uh, are collected around any industry. I think that's just important for for the panel to know about when you are making further considerations about a screen unit for Scotland. We have to get two more members so um, to ask questions, so if we could keep um, answers quite succinct, that would be very helpful. Uh, Alexandra Stewart. Bina, and good morning, panel. We've talked about skills, but I'd like to maybe take a look at employment and how that works in this process. So we have a growing cultural sector, we have more people working in the arts and culture, and the economy is bigger and better. But when it comes to collecting employment data, we still seem to have some gaps in that process. Is it because there's not enough investment? Does that have an impact in the whole process? Uh, or or, or how, how can they be filled? How can that gap in the employment sector be filled? Sorry, I seem to be starting all the questions off. Sorry, panel. Um, from a data perspective, so at BFI, when I'm reporting on employment in the industry at a UK level, we get our data from the Office for National Statistics. So these are collected from their various business surveys um, and their population surveys. And I mentioned business because I looked at it in a whole of uh, GVA and number of companies, etc. And uh, one issue we face with providing data at a, a lower level, so at the Four Nations or regional level, is often the data has been suppressed because it can disclose either an individual or a company. And that is one data issue. I think that, uh, well, I have in Scotland, I was checking the employment figures yesterday and, and actually they've been suppressed for parts of Scotland. Um, so that hinders me from providing a UK picture. How you would fulfill that gap is, is, quite, is quite difficult actually because um, beyond the official statistics will always suppress and because of uh, their rules and regulations around uh, disclosure control. Um, I think it would need further investigation of whether you do an additional research or additional data collection on this. I don't know if the rest of the panel have anything to add to that. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that sort of company level uh, ground up process is probably the one, if we were working on a, that kind of project, um, which we did recently in the Republic of Ireland, uh, we had to use a ground up level approach. So look at individual companies, identify the the number of people who are working within them through a survey process and do it that way. We did the same thing in the current UK uh, screen sector tax reliefs work for the game sector because of the particular issues around SIC codes in that in that industry. Um, 
I can't see it. I can't see another way of doing it other than a, a sort of primary survey piece of work. And as I say, the investment behind it, does that have an impact or not to the same degree? Not uh, seen any evidence of that. Uh, so you, you, you've got no, nothing collated that will actually identify that as, a, as an issue? No. Okay. Thank you, Camille. Uh, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, I probably should have declared a volunteer interest in that I worked in the television production sector for 13 years before I came to the Parliament, so it's a subject close to my heart. Um, I want to pick up Dr Sorensen on a point you made earlier around definitions of what is the sector. Now, um, when I was in uh, television production, we would get very excited on the overnights. We had a couple of hundred thousand viewers, but the reality is today, people across the length and breadth of the country are making content that's achieving millions of views uh, overnight and, and monetizing that. So uh, given that the, the sector has evolved outside of traditional um, film and television production uh, to the online world, to, to web production, uh, content in the charitable or not-for-profit sector, VR and gaming production, advertising and so on, um, how do we best collect uh, data in all those other aspects of the production sector? which are the, the ones that we probably talk about the least uh, in reality, uh, and who should be responsible for collecting that sort of data? Question, the big question. Uh, I think one way maybe to look at this is that currently uh, the screen units work, or the, the future screen units, and most screen work is very focused on production and stimulating and funding production. And there isn't really any, there isn't much data on distribution, A, because it's hard to get, because people, you know, companies don't want to disclosure, uh, disclose it. But, but looking at distribution uh, as much as production data would maybe be a way of, of looking, a different way of uh, providing an optics on the sector. And also think, yeah, this defining what the screen sector is, and and then collating the data from the different agencies who who has information about uh, inwards investment, uh, productions that are funded here, broadcast productions, um, uh, it would would be the way forward. I don't have a quick fix, but certainly more data on on distribution and where things are seen. And, and where they're distributed to would be helpful. I don't know if that's even possible. You would know better than me. I think when we, we talk about the digital landscape and it's created this new extension to the screen sectors, I know the BFI is, I think because film is also, it, it's quite nebulous when you, when you start getting into it. It's, it appears to be structured, but actually it has elements where there is not much structure about it, which makes, gaining any information about it is sometimes quite difficult beyond, say, official data collection or how we look at production, where we actually employ someone to track production in the UK. And I think there's a, a general difficulty in understanding of, of what this, these new, they're not really new screens, but this new digital area actually is, let alone starting to track it and what it's doing and what does it contribute to the economy overall, say. Um, I mean, one way we do it at BFI, we've started really basic, basic in, in a way, but it's not it's still quite complex, where we've, we've started following um, a productions and developments in high-end television, children's television, animation television, and video games that are, uh, are going through the certification process and uh, trying to become officially British, and that's just a starting point. I think there is an element that this is a sector where in a way, they traditionally have, have not been in this data sharing world or providing data to see what's going on because they, they, it appears that they either want to keep within themselves, say, like Netflix, which you can watch anywhere and anyhow, or if you're in, say, the gaming world, they kind of know what's going on and there's a lot of, uh, the, there's a lot of kind of network infrastructure from what I've gleaned from, my, my, from the little I know about it. So overall, it, it's quite difficult because at the moment we have quite a, a structured and almost 
a traditional approach to collecting data on these new sets, but they are not traditional in a way. They work slightly different, and w it, in a way, the data gathering hasn't really adapted enough for them. So it's quite difficult to actually suggest anything at the moment without looking further into them and doing more on the ground work and getting them more involved. I know you, Q, as a trade body, they, they speak a lot to, to um, the games sector, and they do a lot of of events with them just to uh, get them more involved even with the certification so maybe that is one approach where it's more on the ground work but beyond that that that's that's a, just a small suggestion um if i could uh, thank you very much for that uh, response if i could follow this up um uh, perhaps uh, moving into a slightly different area D does the panel have any views on the gathering of data around um the disparity of gender pay in the industry. We talk about it a lot in other industries, but it's, it's perhaps not something we talk about very much in the screen sector, um, or any uh, qualitative or quantitative data that's produced on uh, whether uh, women are being paid the same rates, for example, as freelancers, as, as male counterparts, or the representation of, of women in the industry um uh, in terms of specific roles which are dominated by by one sex or the other uh, how much data is produced on that and uh, where where does the panel think we could do better uh, in that respect there is a report on on diversity in scotland um i think uh, i i was a producer before i came back into academia 10 years ago um and i think and and this is not unique to scotland this this is a pan world thing, um, that the problem is not so much around gender pay, it's how to keep women, especially in the business, once they want to start families. It's not a particularly family-friendly industry, and that's certainly why I left. Um, so that's just an observation. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has. Well, I'd, just say, I'd say I'd flag there are many initiatives that are addressing this. Um, issue that are, are really important, I think, for the screen unit to engage with. I mean, well, there is one uh, specifically around parenting in film, uh, also women in film and TV, uh, with the, which are UK initiatives. I think it's, uh, sorry, the film, uh, the parenting one's called Raising Films, um, uh, and the women in film and TV, both doing really, really good work. Again, then at the international level, there's the uh, Annenberg, uh, you may have come across this um, inclusion uh, rider, if you like, a, an equality for pay issue, which can be put into um, a contract. Uh, at the budgetary level, that, you know, that when um, public funders receive applications, they get a budget and that will have breakdown of, certainly at a high level, um, the named cast uh, pay parity. So that information is, is there within, um, within funders and certainly also in commercial bodies. I think um, foregrounding the importance of this issue is absolutely vital. Um, I think related um, the second question, part of your question was about um, representation, representation on screen. And I'd just like to flag um, there's some great work which is being done by uh, Mr. Toss's colleagues within uh, BFI. Um, Mr. Anson uh, did a presentation on, on Monday about using their filmography database to allocate you know, where different um, genders, ethnicities are being represented, underrepresented in the whole of the filmography of, of British film. And that's absolutely something I think Scotland needs to engage with as, as, as a partner. Thank you. thank you very much and I'd like to thank all our witnesses for coming to give evidence today and that uh, leads to the end of this session and we will now suspend and go into private session. Thank you very much.
Our third item of business today is consideration of the committee's draft annual report for 2017-18. Uh, before inviting contributions from other members, I have a couple of uh, observations that I would like to make. Uh, on page 9 of the annual report in paragraph 18, I think we should put in an additional sentence that explains that uh, we've agreed to wait uh, for the Migration Advisory Committee to publish its final report for the Home Office later this year before returning to our immigration inquiry. I think we all decided that and that's the reason why um, we ha we're kind of waiting uh, and we haven't taken any more evidence on that particular subject. Are members agreed with that? I think it just clarifies matters. Yeah. Yep. And my only other observation is a, a typo on page 12 in the word languages in the second bullet point, if we could fix that, please. Do any other members have comments to make? Mr Green. I'm very surprised that I've got a comment to make, given that I wasn't here for the last 12 months. But I'm going to make some general, just a general observation. that I've done this in, in another committee that I'm in, uh, and I'm trying to gently encourage all committees in the Parliament to include a section uh, or sections on uh, uh, reference to equalities uh, and human rights and also accessibility and the work that committees do in terms of making sure that the work that committees do is as accessible as possible. And uh, I, I, in one of my other committees, I had quite a robust conversation with my colleagues in the committee about um, uh, what more committees could do in reflecting on the work that they've done to ensure that, the, that they are as accessible as possible in terms of uh, users who are, are, are deaf or blind, BSL, subtitling of, of committee meetings uh, and making sure that the work that they do gets out to the widest range of people. Um, and, I, I, and, and we were pleased as a result of that conversation to include a section on uh, the equalities impacts uh, of the work that they had done that year. So it's perhaps just something for all committees to reflect on. Thank you very much. That's a very important and useful contribution. And we have actually responded as a committee uh, to the equalities committees uh, invitation uh, asking us about those very subjects so I can certainly make that uh, uh, response available to you but it's certainly something that we should be aware of and perhaps we could include it in our business planning day uh, going forward to make sure we're always aware of it in future. Any other comments? Uh, on page seven around the Erasmus and Plus inquiry it doesn't mention universities anywhere is linked to the Erasmus programme so I just thought I mentioned somewhere might be Yes, I think that's important. That should be included, obviously. Um, and we obviously take mod uh, uh, evidence from modern languages in university and the importance in terms of delivering our ma modern languages courses in university. So um, that was important evidence and highlighted in the report's press release, as I recall. So uh, we should certainly include that. Any other comments? OK, thank you very much. Are members content to sign off the report for publication now? With those amendments? It will be circulated with those amendments made. Okay, thanks. I shall now suspend the meeting and move into private session. <laughs>